She was Britain's longest reigning monarch. The one constant in a country that changed so much over so many decades. From the post-war era of food rations to the digital age, the Queen moved with the times and the people moved with her. As popular in the 50s as she was well over 50 years later. Through crises inside and outside her family, public support and affection towards her rarely, if ever, wavered. A monarch admired for her longevity and sense of duty, with her beloved husband by her side and as a widow queen. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born at the home of her mother's parents, 17 Bruton Street, in London's Mayfair. Princess Elizabeth was to them as great At the a time, her grandfather, son. King George V, was on the throne. Her father, the Duke of York, was the second son of King George and Queen Mary. When her grandfather died, her uncle Edward became king, but it was a reign that would last just ten months. He abdicated to marry an American divorcee. His irrevocable determination to renounce the throne. In a year that saw three kings, Elizabeth's father assumed the throne. That she would one day become queen was now not in doubt. She met her future husband two years earlier, in 1934, when they attended the wedding of Prince Philip's cousin, Princess Marina of Greece, and the Duke of Kent, who was an uncle of Princess Elizabeth. By the end of the decade, war had broken out and Philip was sent to sea. Elizabeth spent those war years in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. The princess, who was on the eve of her 19th birthday when these pictures were taken, is at the wheel of a 1,500-weight truck in convoy. A monarch of the future, but for now a mechanic, and one not afraid to muck in and get her hands dirty. Today is victory in Europe day. When the war ended, she chose to leave the palace and celebrate with the crowds on the streets of London. Two years later, Princess Elizabeth married Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark. A nation still battered and bruised by war, it was a wedding to lift the country's spirits. In 1949, Charles became the first of four children, soon followed by Anne. For a few years at least, they enjoyed relative normality out of the public spotlight. Then came the news that the Queen's father, King George VI, had passed away at the age of just 56. Elizabeth and Philip were in Kenya, only a few days into a five-month tour of the Commonwealth. At 25 years old, a young woman who never imagined in early childhood that she would one day become queen was now head of state. The coronation took place a year later in 1953, an event the Duke of Edinburgh insisted should be televised for the world to see. In the 60s, Andrew and Edward completed the family. The Queen is said to have worried about her children, like any mother. And on her silver wedding anniversary in 1972, she spoke lovingly about what her family meant to her. Now that we have reached this milestone in our lives, we can see how immensely lucky we have been. Or perhaps fortunate might be a better word. We had the good fortune to grow up in happy and united families. Though the Queen and the Duke's marriage was a lasting success, the same could not be said of their children's. In 1992, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson separated. Princess Anne and Mark Phillips divorced. Then Charles and Diana separated. And a major fire engulfed a large part of Windsor Castle. Little wonder then that she didn't consider her 40th year as Queen to be the happiest of her reign. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. But worse was sadly to come in 1997, when Princess Diana was killed in that Paris car crash. The outpouring of emotion from the public was like nothing this country had ever seen before. The lack of any immediate expression of grief from the Queen or other senior royals did not go down well and the Queen was perceived as being out of step with public sentiment. She had assumed her role as grandmother, protecting William and Harry from the public eye at Balmoral. They waited longer than they'd hoped, but eventually the public got the appearance they'd yearned for, 
and the Queen paid this tribute to Diana in a televised statement. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. That dreadful year was to end on a happier note, when the Queen and Prince Philip celebrated their golden wedding anniversary, and the Queen paid her husband this tribute. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. Outside family life, the Queen had many interests, perhaps most famously horses. She loved riding them and watching them too. A regular at the Derby at Epsom and Ascot, where her horses won on several occasions. Such was her love of the outdoors and determination to protect the natural world. She launched the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy, a conservation project with the mission of creating a network of forests in each of the 53 countries of the Commonwealth. Her dedication to the Commonwealth and particularly her beloved home country never wavered, serving more than 600 charities as royal patron or president. Even after the Duke of Edinburgh retired from public life, the Queen continued her busy diary of royal engagements, a life of public service that saw her host well over 100 state visits. In the new millennium, she was also kept busy not just by others, but by her own milestones. A golden jubilee, a diamond one, the moment in 2015 she became the longest reigning monarch, followed a year later by her 90th birthday. And at the age of 96, a weekend of celebrations to mark her platinum jubilee. In between, Good evening, Mr. Bond. there was that appearance in the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics in London. And while she made the headlines, so did the younger generation of the royal family for the right reasons and the wrong ones. Her second son, Andrew, faced allegations of sexual assault by Virginia Dufre, allegations which he denied. She claimed she was trafficked to have sex with Andrew when she was 17 by convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who was a friend of the prince. In the end, the Queen stripped Andrew of his honorary military roles and royal patronages, and it was agreed that he would stop using his HRH style. In the Queen's later years, it wasn't just Andrew causing problems for her. Harry and Meghan stunned Buckingham Palace, and indeed the world, in a shock announcement that they wanted out of the royal family. A summit meeting was held at Sandringham, and a deal thrashed out that left Harry with rather less than he might have hoped. Gone was his role as Captain General of the Royal Marines. Gone too his position as Commonwealth Youth Ambassador, to which the Queen appointed him. Harry and Meghan began a new life in California. It was there that they gave Oprah Winfrey a bombshell interview, about their old life in the UK and how it left Meghan feeling suicidal. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. And that was a very clear and real and frightening constant thought. It was one of many shocking revelations. Others included allegations of racism within the royal family. A new crisis for the Queen to deal with just as the country, and indeed the whole world, was beginning to emerge from its biggest health crisis for a century. The coronavirus pandemic was a heartbreaking, stressful and anxious time, and the Queen found the words to comfort her people in only her fifth special television address of her reign. I hope in the years to come, everyone will be able to take pride in how they responded to this challenge. And those who come after us will say the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. One year and four days after that television address, the Queen was grieving her own personal loss, as so many had done that year. After 73 years of marriage, her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, passed away at the age of 99. Restrictions on numbers allowed at funerals were still in place, rules that applied to the royal family just as much as everyone else who'd lost loved ones during the pandemic. The widow queen continued her busy diary of engagements 
just as she had with Prince Philip by her side. There were times when, on doctor's orders, those engagements became virtual instead. That commitment to serving her country and the Commonwealth is a legacy she passes on to the new king and those who will follow. With such a loyal sense of duty despite her personal grief, old age and family drama in the background, it isn't hard to see why public affection for the Queen remained as high as ever. This was a duty she did not choose, a destiny which befell her at the age of just 10, a monarch through times of so much change and one whose reign is unlikely to be surpassed any time soon. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit.
Her late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever known. She was the rock on which modern Britain was built. She was dignified, but not distant. She was willing to have fun, whether on a mission with 007 or having tea with Paddington Bear. She brought the monarchy into people's lives and into people's homes. Queen Elizabeth II was this great country's greatest monarch. And for the vast majority of us, it feels impossible to imagine a Britain without her. Her life of public service was underpinned by one crucial understanding, that the country she came to symbolise is bigger than any one individual or any one institution. It is the sum total of all our history and all our endeavours, and it will endure. I, like many others in this chamber, was fortunate to meet the Queen on a number of occasions and was always struck by the strength, the intellect, the modesty, the humility, and often the humour with which she approached her royal duties. And while I have always met her in a professional context as monarch, I'm struck with just how many people across Scotland and indeed across the United Kingdom have had a first-hand encounter with the Queen. Whether they have been invited to her Holyrood garden parties or had the pleasure to meet with her in the many hundreds of events, walkabouts and official openings, including that at her Scottish Parliament, or whether she had taken them wholly by surprise <coughs> with chance encounters on the countryside or villages near Balmoral, people in the length and breadth of Scotland have their own tales of their individual meetings with the Queen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope the House will not mind if I begin with a personal confession. A few months ago, the BBC came to see me to talk about Her Majesty the Queen, and we sat down and the cameras started rolling, and they requested that I should talk about her in the past tense. And I'm afraid I simply choked up, and I couldn't go on. I'm really not easily moved to tears, but I was so overcome with sadness that I had to ask them to go away. And I know that today there are countless people in this country and around the world who have experienced the same sudden access of unexpected emotion. But as we mourn a beloved monarch, we must always remember that she was a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. And my thoughts and prayers are with King Charles III. Queen Elizabeth II was quite simply the most remarkable person I have ever met. I am sometimes asked, among all the world leaders I met, who was the most impressive? And I have no hesitation in saying <coughs> that from all the heads of state and government, the most impressive person I met was Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It's a real pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Lady, and can I congratulate her on her lovely, heartwarming speech. Yes. Mr Speaker, Liberal Democrats join members from all sides of the House in expressing our deepest condolences on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. We are mourning a profound loss. The Queen was a formidable monarch who faithfully served our country for all her life and was loved the world over.
I now call on the clerk of the council to read aloud the text of the proclamation. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We, therefore, the Lords spiritual and temporal of this realm and members of the House of Commons, together with other members of Her Late Majesty's Privy Council and representatives of the realms and territories, aldermen and citizens of London and others, do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to whom we do acknowledge all faith and obedience with humble affection, beseeching God, by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. God save the King! God save the King!
Your Majesty, Prime Minister. Your Majesty. Very good. Come in. I know how you can do this. Me too. I know. Anyway, but um, I mean, what's the take? It's been so touching uh, this afternoon when we arrived here. All those people mm. come to give their condolences. Your flowers. Majesty, my very, very sincere very condolences. They're all very kind. It's a moment I've been dreading, mm. as, as I know a lot of people have. But mm. Mm. try and keep everything going. Absolutely. Come, come, come. Thank you. Come and see. Business for part two of the council. Your Majesty, to make your declaration. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the Queen. I know how deeply you, the entire nation, and I think I may say the whole world, sympathize with me in the irreparable loss we've all suffered. It is the greatest consolation to me to know of the sympathy expressed by so many to my sister and brothers, and that such overwhelming affection and support should be extended to our whole family in our loss. To all of us as a family, as to this kingdom, and the wider family of nations of which it is a part, my mother gave an example of lifelong love and of selfless service. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands and of the Commonwealth realms and territories throughout the world. In this purpose, I know that I shall be upheld by the affection and loyalty of the peoples whose sovereign I have been called upon to be, and that in the discharge of these duties, I will be guided by the counsel of their elected parliaments. In all this, I am profoundly encouraged by the constant support of my beloved wife. I take this opportunity to confirm my willingness and intention to continue the tradition of surrendering the hereditary revenues, including the Crown Estate, to my government for the benefit of all in return for the sovereign grant which supports my official duties as head of state and head of nation. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. I now invite Your Majesty to subscribe both copies of the instrument confirming the oath has been taken.
Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
who called to his mercy our late sovereign lady Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We therefore, the Lord spiritual and temporal of this realm, and members of the House of Commons, together with other members of Her late Majesty's Privy Council, and representatives of the realms and ter territories, aldermen and cities, citizens of London and others, do now hereby with one voice and consent of tongue and heart publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign, happy of memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to whom we do acknowledge all faith and obedience with humble affection, beseeching God by whom kings and queens do reign to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. Given at St. James's Palace on the 10th day of September and in the year of our Lord 2022. for His Majesty the King. Hip hip! Hip hip!
ein diweddar sofran a Hines Elizabeth Arail. We come together today following the passing of our late sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince, Charles Philip Arthur George. Hooray! Royal salute! Reason! Out! Whereas it hath pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. God save the King! God save the King!
Three cheers, three cheers for King Charles. Hip hip. Hooray! Hip hip. Hooray! Hip hip. Hooray!